Good morning and uh, welcome to the Festival Bloomsday Montreal 2021 10th Anniversary Academic Panel. Uh, we are pleased to have returning uh, preeminent Joyce scholar uh, John McCourt from uh, Trieste, uh, Marcelo uh, Zaboloy from Argentina, uh, Spanish translator of uh, Ulysses, and some new faces this year, uh, Casey Lawrence, Mary Lawton, and Cleo Hannaway-Oakley. Uh, before I introduce you to your moderator, Geraldina Mendez, uh, some uh, changes in the uh, program uh, this afternoon. Unfortunately, uh, uh, presenters uh, Derek Bateman and, um, and Peter Stockland are unavailable, but we will have uh, uh, Cleo Hannaway Oakley and uh, Marcelo Zaboloy. So our program this morning, we'll have uh, John McCourt uh, uh, first presenting, followed by Casey Lawrence and uh, Mary Lawton. And now I'll, uh, before I turn it over to, uh, to Geraldina, let me introduce her. Uh, Geraldina is a, uh, is a, a pianist and a vocal performer. She obtained a Master of Fine Arts degree at the Tchaikovsky National Music Academy of the Ukraine. She participated in the fourth international Johann Sebastian Bach piano competition, the Bach seminar in 2001, and the 13th international Johann Sebastian Bach competition. For 12 years, she has worked as a collaborative pianist. She also studied lyrical singing for 10 years had the opportunity to perform with orchestras at opera galas and gave numerous chamber recitals in several halls in Caracas City. She arrived in Montreal in 2014 and started singing opera arias in the Montreal Metro in 2015. The next summer, she joined the STM program, Les Etoiles du Metro. During this time, she was interviewed by La Presse and by René Omier Roy for the Radio Canada program Culture Club. Uh, a passionate Joycean, she leads Spanish language Ulysses reading groups on Twitter. Uh, Bloomsday Montreal published her essay on Wagner's influence on James Joyce, particularly in their newsletter, Joyicity. So uh, I'll turn you over now to our moderator, uh, Geraldina Mendez. Geraldina. Good morning. Thank you, Miles. Welcome to the academic panel session one celebrating the 10th anniversary event with the theme Origins. We want to start our event speaking with John McCord. We're really grateful with him because he's so busy and he made time for us. So um, John McCord, he's co-director of the Trieste Joyce School and is president of the International James Joyce Foundation. And he will speak on the origin of Bloomsday, Dublin, 1954. Hello, I'm John. Okay, I'm just sure if you're hearing me, people, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so thank you, Geraldine, and thank you, Miles. It's, uh, it's lovely to be here, um, well, here in Rome, but also here at the same time in Montreal, and I'm delighted to be part of the Montreal Bloomsday you know, for the second consecutive year. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is part of a project that I, I also talked about last year, which is um, that of writing, if you like, a history of the reception of this is Ulysses in Ireland, a uh, hundred years of Ulysses in Ireland, and that's going to be a book which will come out next year. So I thought I'd focus in this year's uh, talk on, uh, I suppose, what we consider in many ways the first Doomsday celebration in Dublin, which took place in 1954. It, it, it often feels like Bloomsday has been around forever, of course, but uh, it is, as we know, uh, quite a recent phenomenon. Now, Joyce, as we also know, of course, was not the most popular writer in Ireland. He's still not the most popular writer in Ireland. And so it was a, um, a rather interesting group of um, literary figures who decided that it, was, it made sense to um, celebrate and celebrate um, this, this day um, in a very particular way on the 16th of June, 1954. A part of the initial impulse for this came from a certain Or Shelton Schofield, or better known as the decent Dubliner 
called Sam Suttle, who published a letter under this pseudonym in the Irish Times, a very popular habit of letter writing in the Irish Times under pseudonyms, in April 1951, proposing the foundation of the James Joyce Society in Dublin. Now, there was already a thriving James Joyce Society in New York, which already, by the early 50s, had a membership of some 350 people. In his letter to the Irish Times, Sam <coughs> Suttle um, complains about the lack of a Joyce infrastructure in Dublin and of, and I quote, the ridiculous position in which we stand vis-a-vis -vis the world by our persistent ignoring of this great Dublin-born artist. After all, he says, we are in the tourist market and these misguided foreigners think quite a lot of Joyce. I suppose this signals to us um, how Irish Joyce reception has always um, been organised with an eye on foreigners, be they misguided or um, be, they, be they right in their appreciation of Joyce. And this letter is no different. Uh, Subtle suggests, quote, the raising of a subscription limited to two and six a head so as to make it popular and to Irish citizens so that the wrong may be righted within the family to place a plaque on to Brighton Square. So he wants to raise money to celebrate Joyce's birthplace by putting up a plaque on to Brighton Square in Rathgar. Um, this proposal came to nothing, although a plaque was eventually placed on to Brighton Square um, nine years later, in 1963, after Professor Frederick Young of Montclair State College in New Jersey visited Dublin and was disturbed to find no plaque marking Joyce's birthplace. Um, he went to Dublin um, with a bunch of students from his university and they set about addressing what he called in another letter to the paper, um, this sad and intolerable situation. So Frederick Young and his graduate class raised the considerable sum of 170 pounds um, sterling back in 1963 to purchase a plaque. Eventually a 35 pound bronze plaque arrived from Newark and read birthday place of James Joyce, poet novelist, 1882, 1941, presented by Montclair State College, New Jersey, USA, Bloomsday, 16 June, 19. 64. So rather shamefully, uh, Dublin City Council or uh, Irish Joyceans were not able to manage to achieve this placing of the plaque. It took, uh, it took the graduate students uh, from the United States to make it happen. In an article in praise of these students, the newspaper, the Cork Examiner, commented, James Joyce, perhaps, has never been really understood in his own city. And the only thing which keeps some people from still looking askance at his works is the regard in which they are held by people of literary merit abroad. End of quote. So again, this connection with abroad in order for Joyce to be appreciated at home. There was a good local turnout for the unveiling of the plaque with speeches by Professor Young of Montclair College and local Irish Joycean and architect Neil Montgomery, who marveled that, and I quote, neither the electricity supply board nor the Pembroke estate, nor even Common Corporation has found some reason for preventing the erection of the plaque. The owner of the house, a Miss Howie, we're told, put a brave face on things, saying, and I quote her, that anticipation of the event was worse than the actuality. Her one thought while the ceremonies were going on was that she hoped that John Ryan, Roger McHugh, and Niall Montgomery wouldn't jump off the chair onto her begonias. Um, there are photographs of this, and I apologize, I haven't managed to um, have them ready for this talk. Uh, John Ryan um, was the owner of um, the, the Bailey Pub in Dublin and the founder of the famous Envoy magazine, which did a special Joyce issue in 1951. Roger McHugh is the professor of Anglo-Irish Literature in, in University College Dublin. Um, a huge uh, writer of articles about um, Joyce, although he does have one about Barney Kiernan's pub in 
Little Britain Street. And Niall Montgomery was, um, um, as I said, an architect and a very keen Joycean. But that was 10 years after the year I'm interested in. I want to go back to 1954 and to Sam Suttle. He proposed, as I said, the formation of a Dublin Joyce Society with a view to gathering Joyce materials and to redeeming what he called the slight on Joyce's memory. The prominent journalist Seamus Kelly of the Irish Times, who wrote the Quidnunc column, um, reported, and he, he reported on Suttle's letter, he, re he, re he said he had received a most heartening response from around the country, from Clonakilty in County Cork to Castle Blaney in County Monaghan. Now, um, Kelly went on to serve in the original council with Suttle, with Niall Montgomery, and then I, I quote from him the other members. We have the blushing violet who writes authoritatively about Joyce over the nom de plume of Andrew Cass. This was um, John Garvin, who was by day a secretary general of a government department and by night a covert Joycean. Um, C.P. Curran, Joyce's old friend, the playwright Lennox Robinson, and then what he calls the Hydra or Malta headed monster who calls himself Miles Nagopolin, Flan O'Brien, or Brian O'Noulon. And finally, the final member of the troop was a transient, he's referred to in this term, called Ernie Anderson, who was included, we're told, because he was one of the few Americans who had ever come to Dublin without claiming that he knew Joyce well in his Paris days. So this was the somewhat motley crew that originally conceived of an Irish James Joyce society. And within months, plans were afoot to hold Dublin's first Bloomsday celebration, which would be described in the Irish Times as the oddest pilgrimage the city had ever seen. In a vintage cab, Joyce devotees and one distant relative of the writer visited all the places mentioned in the book to mark the 50th anniversary of Ulysses Day, as they called it. The newspaper concludes, the rest of Dublin took no notice. The event was led by um, Miles Nagopoulin or Brian O'Nolan, and with him were Anthony Cronin, the writer, the poet Patrick Kavanagh, the scholar Con Leventhal, and Joyce's cousin, Tom Joyce. Flann O'Brien was the principal, principal instigator, and Kavanagh immortalized the happening in poetry, writing, I made the pilgrimage in the Bloomsday Swelter, from the Martello Tower to the Cabby's Shelter. Ten years later, he would recall being what he called one of the fateful band who went out on the 50th anniversary of Bloomsday. And he noted that the expedition got scant courtesy from many people, some of whom would later become involved in Bloomsday. In other words, they were at it when it was neither popular nor profitable. On their way back from the Matello Tower, the group stopped at various public houses and, according to Kavanagh, some well-known publicists appeared on the scene to have a good laugh at us. And he asks in his article, will we get pensions for our day's outing? Now, not only did they stop in some pubs on the way back into town, but clearly they had stopped on some pubs on the way out to Sandy Cove. And there is footage available on the Internet, which shows that they were very much the worst for wear, in particular Flannabrand. Anthony Cronin later recalled that the pilgrimage had been Flann O'Brien's idea, and I quote from him. It would be wrong to say that in 1954, Joyce was a neglected figure in Ireland. He was in many quarters seriously disapproved of. Hated might not be too strong a word to describe the attitude. Not only the church and the devout disapproved of him, politicians, feared to make any reference to a notorious blasphemer. Even the literary establishment disapproved. Now, Cronin, I think, had a great sense of uh, the atmosphere around Joyce at this time. And he, of course, in later life became a great uh, witness to what it had been like to celebrate Joyce. Cronin underlines the significance of the celebration as an assertion of his importance, Joyce's importance to us, as he says, as well as a rebellion against dullness, hypocrisy, and ignorance. So this was a somewhat rebel act that these men believed they were engaged in. And Cronin in later life would complain about the commercialization of, of Bloomsday, which he felt 
took attention away rather than drew attention to Joyce's Ulysses. Uh, let me again quote from Cronin. All those who took part knew the book more or less by heart. Even Kavanagh, who in accordance with his general policy of running down any Irish writer, young or old, living or dead, who was the object of any praise, here or elsewhere, sometimes expressed reservations, would frequently and for the most part gleefully quote it. And Miles, though fed up with being described by those who knew no better as a Joycean writer, and therefore occasionally impelled to snarl at the mention of the name, fully understood the greatness of the master and his achievement. And as for my younger self, I believed, and incidentally still believe, that Joyce was not only the greatest European novel of the 20th century, but one of the greatest writers who ever lived, worthy to be mentioned with Shakespeare, Tolstoy, and Homer. Now, Cronin's was definitely the minority view in 1954. The uncertain editorial in the Irish Times to mark the golden jubilee of Bloomsday reveals the still precarious state of Joyce's reputation in his own country. And let me quote from that. Only time will prove whether or not Ulysses is one of the world's great novels. Joyce has received from Ireland less than the official honour to which he is entitled. However, there are signs that this state of affairs is changing and that as time passes, more domestic recognition may come his way. When the 100th anniversary of Bloomsday comes around, Leopold Bloom either may be forgotten or may stand in stony effigy as high as Nelson stands today. So there were two extremes. There was going to be no middle ground for Joyce, according to the Irish Times. He would, he would be forgotten or he would stand in stony high effigy. As it turned out, the vision of the future conserved, conceived by the journalist Bernard Scher in 1964, 10 years later, proved perhaps to be a more accurate prediction as to what would come. He wrote a piece called uh, William and James, again in the Irish Times, and this is what he wrote. And he, he, he um, projected into the future to 2004, to the centenary of the day in which Ulysses takes place. He says, it is the year 2004 AD, June 16. The supersonic VTOs are landing their distinguished passengers from all centers of terrestrial and extraterrestrial civilization on O'Connell airstrip, affording them a hasty glimpse as they drop onto the landing pad of the last two Georgian buildings in Dublin, out there in the direction of the South Circular Sewer. The Irish Times has just announced the winner of its competition for novel for a novel based on the early life of Leopold Bloom. And the book, printed by the new instantaneous computer-fed uh, process, process, is ranged alongside the 500 or so scholarly contributions to Joyce studies since the year began on January the 1st. The 17th cousin of the master has been hounded down and photographed. The alcohol dispensaries are open, opening their automated doors, their slot machines gleaming with expectancy. Bloomsday 100 is on. So, with a, an element of hyperbole, obviously, in his description, he wasn't so terribly wrong um, about looking for third cousins or 17th cousins of Joyce, about novels um, based on the lives of Joyce's fictional characters, or indeed based on the lives of Joyce's own family or indeed of the in predicting the huge explosion in scholarly attention that Joyce would get uh, in these intervening years from the 1950s from the middle of the last century up until today but back in 1954 um, all of this was very simply a vision of the future and certainly not a photograph of how things were for Joyce and for Ulysses in Dublin in that year so I think I'll stop there um, and go back to Geraldina. Ah, thank you, John. So uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning with the cancellation stuff, my head is off, um, that you can put your, que your questions on the question and answer section if you have any. So we already have one. Um, the site for Joyce's short story, The Dead, is being converted into a hostel. 
What does this say about Joyce's legacy in Ireland? Well, this is a very sore point um, that we have been trying to campaign about um, for the last two years. I think it see it shows that we take in Ireland Joyce for granted. In 1967 in Dublin, we had the very first International Joyce Symposium in June. Three months before that event, um, number seven, Eccles Street was torn down by demolishers. And the, probably the most, you know, um, easily recognizable site in Irish literature, the home of Leopold and Molly Bloom was destroyed. And all we were left with was the front door, which today is to be found in the James Joyce Center in Dublin. Um, it's depressing that all these years later, um, over 50 years later, we have the 15 Ushers Island, a building which is recognisable to anyone who's ever read Joyce's short stories, and many more will read his short stories than will ever read Ulysses, that we could allow that building to be um, gutted, to be radically changed, so as to house 57 beds. Um, we're not talking about some kind of, you know, stylish recuperation of a beautiful old building. We're talking about um, disfiguring a building which is still very much in the shape and the form and bearing the features that Joyce so carefully described uh, in the story, The Dead. Um, we, as some of you will know, we had a very loud um, petition signed by writers from around the world, from Salman Rushdie to Ian McEwan to Colm Tobin to Sally Rooney and, and so on and so forth, uh, all of whom were calling on the Irish uh, Ministry for Culture, but also on the Dublin City Council to, to stop this. Um, but it fell on deaf ears and permission has, I'm afraid to say, been given to develop this site as a hostel at a time in which of course, none of us really can travel, in which Dublin is awash with hotel rooms um, and hostels. Um, and it really is the last thing the city needs right now. If they were to tell me they were turning it into a homeless hostel, I think that would be a far better use for it. it the other thing to say about the hostel, which is on the Liffey, um, which is right as you walk from O'Connell Bridge down to the Guinness, to Guinness Brewery, which many people will do uh, visiting the city, it would be a perfect place to stop off and, and have a visit and could be maintained, um, you know, not for a huge amount of money. It wouldn't have to cost uh, the earth. So what I'm seeing in Ireland is a lack of joined up thinking. On the one hand, we're opening Moli, the Museum of Irish Literature, at a cost of 11 million. And, and wonderful, I'm delighted they've done that. On the other hand, we let a building worth less than half a million be bought by a property developer um, and be completely disfigured and turned into something that will not do honour to its Joycean connections. So I feel strongly about it. I think it's a great shame. Yeah, that, that sounds horrible. We hope it doesn't, well, we, we would hope that it doesn't happen. It shouldn't. Uh, we have a question from our friend David Sherman. Uh, what is your take on the current status of Bloomsday festivals in Dublin and around the world? Has it got a solid future? From, from Dave, yeah, um, I, I would like to think so. I mean, I think um, the last two years have not been easy for any of us in any walk of life. And yet um, Joyce, uh, Joyce's Bloomsday continues to be celebrated with great enthusiasm around the place. Um, we're, I'm currently involved in the International James Joyce Symposium, which was to be in Trieste and sadly is online. Um, but it's not sadly because it's perfectly a perfectly wonderful event. Um, uh, our numbers are are very healthy. We had we have over three hundred and fifty people signed up for that event, so there is clearly great interest in it. Um, I I think the Dublin Bloomsday um, is one of the great celebrations um, of Joyce's writing, and there are many Dublin Bloomsdays. Many of them are tourist oriented, but many of them are community oriented and they arise out of communities in Dublin, which have connections, if you like, with, with where Joyce lived or where parts of the book are set. So I'm thinking about places like Sandy Cove, uh, but not only. So um, I, I like that 
we have to be very careful that we're not simply exploiting Joyce through um, this commercialization, which it is sometimes of Bloomsday, um, but we're actually trying to explore and understand and lead people to read his works, because I think that's what unites us in, in, in what we're doing here. Um, and we all know that um, you never finish reading Joyce and, um, and a Bloomsday can, you know, I think revive people's enthusiasm uh, through, through a, a, a diff what it can sometimes be, particularly if you're reading on your own, a, a difficult reading process. Reading Ulysses from start to finish on your own uh, is, is not the easiest of, of enterprises. I, I recently had a friend who was actually in school with me, in, in, in classmate of mine. Uh, he announced very proudly the other night on um, Facebook that he was a, he's a marathon runner, by the way, that, that he had finally, after three attempts, finished Ulysses. And he thanked his coach, which was which was me. I didn't coach him, but he 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 felt the need to tell tell me this and tell other people this and to celebrate it. And you just know that he's hooked now, and um, he'll either start reading Ulysses again, or he will embark on the even more ambitious project of of reading Finnegan's Wake. So I my for me the appeal of Bloomsday is that it makes Joyce uh, a little bit accessible to people. Um, it, it's celebratory. It's fun. Nobody gets hurt, um, and I really look forward to us being able to to have Bloom Days in in person, as we say, um, in the in the years to come, and, and not simply on screen. Okay, I, I have a question. Uh, it's a it's a really weird question. Uh, what what is your take about the repatriation of uh, Joyce's remains that I think in Switzerland, like rep repatriation of the remains? Um, how do you think if it how uh, that would uh, like um, would be good for Bloomsday in Ireland? What do you think about this? Because it's an interesting controversy. I, I find. Yeah, I think it's a terrible waste of time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think Joyce is quite happy where he is. Joyce spent his entire adult life living outside of Ireland, and um, he doesn't need to be brought back to Dublin in order to be remembered. Um, I think it would be going against what he himself wanted. And were he to be dug up and flown back, and flown back to an Ireland that will not even preserve um, the most iconic site in Irish literature, I go back to it, Fifteen Ushers Island, the the story in which the dead is set. Uh, anyone who has visited his grave in in Zurich will agree with me, in the Flunturn Cemetery, that it is a beautiful memorial to Joyce, and it seems that he and 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 Nora there are perfectly. At peace, and I really don't see any reason to disturb that peace. Um, Irish who wants to go and celebrate him um, can 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 take off and, and do that um, without any problem um, anytime they want um, in, in in Zurich. So I, I'm not in favour of it. I'm afraid we don't need. He doesn't need to go back to Dublin. He's already <laughs> everywhere in Dublin. Okay, we have a question from Kevin. They like, like our, our boss <laughs> um, and uh, the leader of the Finnegan's Way reading group. He asks, in your opinion, what would Joyce make of contemporary Bloomsday celebrations? Well, I think he'd be rather pleased uh, myself. He would be rather pleased that he was in the public eye. He had a great sense of the importance of marketing and the need to sell his books. This is a man whose first three books, Chamber Music, Dubliners, and A Portrait of the Artist, made him absolutely no money. And so he was really a starving artist until, um, certainly until 1922, um, when he began to have some major benefactors. And so I think he would be delighted to see that his book was being read and that, um, you know, not in some kind of nostalgic way, as in, you know, recreating this Dublin in the rare old times kind of thing, but rather because his book is a book which poses lots of questions. It posed lots of questions of the society back in the day, just as it poses lots of problems, lots of questions to our society today and is a means of making us think. And I mean, I suppose that's one of the things that most writers would want us to do is to actually think. And so I think um, Joyce's Ulysses has great relevance for Ireland as we understand it today. But, but not only, for, for questions that affect, affect us all around the world. Um, big questions like how we organize society and what is our sense of justice, for example. So, 
So if, if Bloomsday can lead people to consider these issues, I think he would fully approve. And I think he would be amused by much of the gimmick, gimmicky thing, many of the gimmicky things that are also connected with this celebratory um, event. And he would be amused also at seeing himself being turned almost into a kind of secular saint. You know, it's, it's almost as if he's challenging St. Patrick and that Bloomsday is almost a kind of an, an Irish national day uh, at, this, uh, at this point. I think he'd find that um, something to have a chuckle at. Okay, I'm going to ask a last question because uh, John has to go, like in five minutes. Um, the last question is going to be, do you have any other hint for those who struggle with Joyce? Yeah, um, I just finished writing a book in Italian on um, a guide to Ulysses, um, precisely aimed at people who were trying to read the book for the first time. Um, and I think it's the first time for a first time reader, it is it is difficult. And I think there's it would be silly to say other than that. Um, one of the things I personally find useful is to, um, well, to read it out loud, to slow it down. And to take each of the 18 episodes as though they were almost a work in themselves. So 18 singular works. You're not going to like all 18 chapters. And if you don't like one, it wouldn't be the end of the world to skip it. Um, because we're not under pressure to read this book in a hurry from beginning to end. So I think there's nothing wrong with saying I really can't bear the oxen of the sun. I just don't get it. And just to maybe read a summary of it or, or the basics about it and to skip on to the next. Most people who do that will inevitably go back because you don't like leaving holes in the puzzle. And so um, you can go back and you can, you can engage in what Joyce calls retrospective rearrangement and piece it together again. When I first read Ulysses, my professor in college told us to skip the first three episodes with Stephen Dedalus because he said he's a bore. And it's full of philosophy. And if you're not interested in philosophy, you won't get it. Not sure that was great advice. But we, if you start with Leopold Bloom, it is a more accessible entrance point into, into the book. So I think the idea is to take the pressure off yourself by saying, if a chapter really isn't working for you, you know, you shouldn't feel like you have to focus on it. Think of the way we read the Bible. We don't sit down and read it from beginning to end. Um, we read and we focus on certain pieces of it and we and we and we gather, gradually immerse ourselves in it um, or, or similarly a, a great poem like the Divina Commedia it's not for reading from beginning to end it's not um, it's not Harry Potter um, so I, I think that's the thing to do and not to be afraid of taking your time and not to be afraid of getting very frustrated and very annoyed at times uh, with Joyce because um, there are times when you do feel like you're looking into a black hole and you can't really understand it Okay, thank you very much. So, I would I would hear you for hours, but I know that you're like hyper busy. So, thank you very much. And and you. look, yeah. I look forward to read your book because I can read in Italian. I don't speak Italian, but we Span people that speak Spanish, we can read it. So I, I hope I can. I think you can figure most of it out, and you know all the Ulysses. Yeah, I, I want to put my hands on it. So. Excellent. So see, I hope to see you next year on the 100th anniversary. That'll be lovely. Yeah. And good luck with the rest of your festival. Thank and you. Thanks for Thank inviting me. Much. And Thank nice you. smiles also. Okay. Take care. Bye. I'm going to stay tuned just for a minute and watch. <laughs> okay. So um, for those who just tuned in, because we have people that watch us uh, on YouTube, we are in the academic panel session one the 10th anniversary event with the, tem the theme origins. It's the 10th anniversary of Bloomsday in Montreal. Our second guest, our second panelist is Casey Lawrence. We wanted to have her since last year, but it wasn't possible because she was, I, I think I remember that she was at the time in Ireland and she had to come back to Canada. It was really complicated, but now we have her with us. We, we're, we're thrilled because she has She's going to talk about my favorite part, maybe. Well, I have many favorite parts, but for me, the, the scene uh, in the brothel is like the culmination point when Blooms becomes like, um, like the, the soubrette. I was like, okay, this, does, this cannot go further than this. 
So I'm too excited. I, I jumped ahead. I have to present her. Casey Lawrence is a PhD candidate at Trinity College Dublin. And her PhD research is currently funded with a Social Science and Humanity Research Council of Canada grant. And she's working on a dissertation where she compares, um, where she talks about literary representations of cross-dressing in modern text of uh, James Joyce, Vir Virginia Woolf, and Una Barnes. Uh, her presentation is called From Cap and Apron to Bella Cohen, the Genetics of Vice-like Corsets. Welcome, Casey. I remind everyone while she's talking, and I think you're going to love this as, as I'm going, going to, you can leave your questions in the section for questions and answer, and you can ask anything you want. She's going to be thrilled to answer. Welcome. Thank you so nice much. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I have to tell you, I'm your fan. I'm following you, following you on Twitter uh, since 2019, and you're the best at tweeting all the all what happens in all the uh, uh, the symposiums, uh, joy symposiums all over the world. You're awesome. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> That's my praise. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, hold on. Just let me share my screen real quick. There we go. Okay, is that working? Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me and for inviting me. Um. When I first learned that the topic for today, this year's Bloomsday uh, would be origins, I immediately knew that I wanted to do a talk on on genetics and that scene in particular. Um. So textual genetics rather than biological genetics um, is the study of a text's development uh, from idea to notes to drafts to publication. Um. And it's a particularly useful framework for discussing Joyce's work. Um, Joyce's methodology, and especially his near encyclopedic texts, Ulysses of Finnegan's Wake, lends itself to genetic study, not only due to the sheer amount of sources and intertextual references he uses, uh, but also because of the documentation that has been preserved, thanks to foresight on the part of Joyce's friends, family, and correspondents. Uh, as scholars, we not only have access to official publication records and early published versions of his texts, but also Joyce's personal and professional correspondence, notebooks, note sheets, fair copies, type drafts with corrections and additions, and pre and post publication edits of these books. Um, despite the field of Joyce and genetics having been around since, and I'm not going to lie, before I was born, uh, we are still making tons of new discoveries about the sources and techniques that Joyce used 100 years on. Many of these discoveries are now happening due to the digitization of resources, uh, which has made it so much easier to search archived newspaper clicking, clippings, books, and even more ephemeral sources, such as advertisements, um, which are now available in online museum collections. And um, while many of the documents that Joycean geneticists rely on have been reproduced in the James Joyce archive. The JJA was published in the 70s and later acquisitions of Joyce material is obviously not included. Uh, prior to 2000, there hadn't been a discovery of a manuscript, manuscript cache uh, in decades and the JJA was considered a, a fairly complete resource in terms of what had survived at that point. However, the National Library of Ireland bought a major consignment of uh, Joyce papers at auction in 2000, formerly belonging to John Quinn, a friend of the Joyce's, uh, including the draft of Circe that I'm going to be talking about today. The acquisition uh, and two subsequent major buys in 2002 and 2006 have revealed that more original documentation of Joyce's processes exist and may continue to be unearthed as private collections are brought back into circulation. The John Quinn draft manuscript of Circe is particularly revealing not only as an early fragment of the episode, but also because of this list of items on the screen here. Uh, these have been just transcribed by Dennis Rose, um, and most of the items are crossed off in blue crayon with one item crossed off in orange. Joyce wrote extensive lists of words and phrases from which to draw inspiration. Most of these contained are, are contained in the notebooks that he carried with him and copied two note sheets on larger pieces of paper that he reread when drafting Ulysses. There are two things striking about this particular example. First, that Joyce clearly had the source for this material in front of him when he made the list. And second, that he made the list on the same page that he began drafting the episode. 
The list appears at the top of the page where the Circe draft begins. Um, the protodraft scene here incorporates words from the list to create the scene where Bloom in Bella Cohen's brothel undergoes sadomasochistic, a sadomasochistic punishment fantasy, which includes elements of cross-dressing and humiliation. Uh, if we look back at the list briefly, um, we can see that Joyce's sources were clearly chosen specifically for this scene and include such lovely phrases as laced into corsets with cruel force, punishment frock, vice-like corset, and fascinated by sister's stays. Many of you might remember these phrases from the published text of Ulysses, where they appear largely unaltered from where they enter the prototext uh, here. Um, we can see here where these phrases enter protodraft 1b. I've color-coded them for ease of identification, and hopefully that's also accessible. Um, here, the newly gender-swapped Bello appears in an alpine outfit, grinding his heel into Bloom's neck. He says, feel my entire weight, footstool, the throne of my glorious heels so glistening in their proud erectness, incorporating four notes from the list. Bloom, enthralled, promises never to disobey, and then Bello describes how he will tremble in anticipation of punishment, heel discipline soon to be inflicted. Bloom will now be put in his punishment frock and forced to shed his masculine garments. I also want to note that heel discipline is not included in the list of notes, but is frequently used in the source, which lends further evidence that Joyce had the source with him or very recently read it before drafting and added even more terms from the source than the notes he, uh, that he made. The description um, Bellow gives of how Bloom will be cross-dressed comes directly from the source material as well. You will be wigged, painted, and powdered as they are. Tape measurements will be taken next to your skin. You will be laced with cruel force into vice-like corsets, the absolute outside edge. Your figure restrained in net tight dresses and pretty, pretty petticoats. You will feel the pull-pull of the skirt. The lovely, frilly feel of laces around your bare legs will remind you. While some material gets added between this draft and publication, the words taken from the list go generally unaltered in the published Ulysses. You can just take a quick look here. This is from the Gabler edition, and you can see the highlighted phrases from the list and draft 1B remain mostly the same with some small tweaks and rearranging. Uh, the second section gets broken up and spread out as new material enters the text, but the essence of the scene and the exact wording from the original list remains intact. You can see this particularly with now for your punishment frock, you will shed your masculine garments. And again, in tape measurements will be taken next to your skin. You will be laced with cruel cool force into vice-like corsets of soft putil with whalebone busk and so on. These notes come from a penny weekly called Bits of Fun, which printed pinup drawings, stories, and entertaining letters to the editor. The Joyce used bits of fun as a source has been known from Joyce's correspondence with Frank Budgen, uh, who supplied Joyce with what he called some comic paper of a bold type as might be found on our Puritan shores, uh, which he makes mention of in his memoir, James Joyce on the Making of Ulysses. Joyce acknowledged receipt of such parcels in September and October 1920, writing, thanks for the letter and the papers. The latter is very usefully useful, especially bits of fun, of which send me any back numbers you can find. However, until Peter Farrar's discovery of cap and apron, the exact issues available to Joyce and the content therein was completely unknown. The bits of fun issues were discovered not by a Joycean, but by a researcher of transgender history, Peter Farrar. Farrar wrote several books and articles uh, on cross-dressing in Victorian and Edwardian periodicals throughout the late 1990s and discovered a letter from Cap and Apron in 1997 or three years before the John Quinn protodraft of Circe that I've just showed you uh, was acquired by the NLI. Farrar had access only to the published Ulysses when he identified this letter in Bits of Fun as a source for Ulysses and none of the materials had been digitized yet. The rediscovery of Farrar's discovery around 2009 led other researchers, including Elisabetta D'Arme, Jennifer Burns-Levin, and Ronan Crowley to further investigate Bits of Fun. Bits of Fun and its early iteration photo bits are among the earliest forerunners to contemporary fetish magazines. The letter signed cap and apron appears in Bits of Fun on August 7th, 1920, as part of an ongoing column called Confidential Correspondence. 
The confidential correspondence column was introduced in October 1911 and continued with few interruptions until December 1920. It's one of the most well-documented distribution of letters on cross-dressing during the early 20th century. Cross-dressing men and transgender women wrote to the magazine to share their stories with like-minded individuals, those who possess the kink, uh, as per the wording in the magazine. Like the rest of the paper, which comprised of a serial story, two or more shorter stories, miscellaneous comic pieces, and many photographs and drawings of women in various states of undress, the material was always intended to titillate. Though some of the letters discussed cross-dressing as a way of life or entertainment, such as drag, um, most were designed for kinky readers, including gay men. Much like the gay male erotica that exists today, the audience for this material was largely comprised of straight women. And on the rare occasions that the paper did not print confidential correspondence, female re readership would decline and the paper would get furious letters to the editor demanding its reinstatement. While earlier versions of the paper may have had saucy stories and mild nudities in the front pages, uh, which were which were designed to appeal to the average heterosexual man, um, the confidential correspondence column is altogether a different breed. Stories often involved forced humiliation of men and teenage boys at the hands of their mothers, nurses, or wives. These stories are altogether kinkier than pretty much anything else in the paper, and us, as such, were often subject to much more censorship as well. An excellent example of these kind of stories uh, that were published is, in fact, Cap and Apron, which tells the story of an 18-year-old boy subjugated by his mother's parlor maid at her request. To correct misbehavior, she punishes him by dressing him in her uniform, including a vice-like corset, shoes two sizes too small, and kid gloves, and then spanks him across her knees and ties his wrists to a hook for the night. Joyce took several notes from this story for his list. The word man tamer, which applies extremely well to ringmaster Bellow as he subjugates Bloom, while not part of the letter's vocabulary, nevertheless suits the tone of the story um, and the parlor maid's role in the author's uh, discipline. These stories often fit the same template of a man who confesses to enjoying cross-dressing as an adult, reliving an experience of his childhood where he was forcibly cross-dressed in adolescence as a formative sexual experience. Joyce Rudge wrote to Budgeon that the stories were very one-sided but most useful, perhaps noting the fact that it always seems to be those who enjoyed the kink who wrote in rather than, say, someone whose formative experience being non-consensually cross-dressed was traumatic. Budgeon writes that the correspondence columns revealed bits of fun to be the official organ of the tight lacing and heel drill specialists in England, with every letter having the authentic, saccharine, pedantic accent of perversity. In 2010, Ronan Crowley identified a total of 20 correspondence letters published between uh, August 7th and October 9th, 1920, uh, from which Joyce took notes or inspiration. These include letters from Cap and Apron, um, Not an Irish Rebel, A Happy Slave, Corset Lover, and Archie, uh, the latter of which speaks of envying a corset lover named Gerald and is likely the source of the dear Gerald who converted Bloom to be a true corset lover when he was a female impersonator in the high school play, vice versa. He got that kink, fascinated by sister's stays. Now, dearest Gerald uses pinky grease paint and gilds his eyelids cult of the beautiful. Unfortunately, though Joyce would have liked more issues of the paper uh, to used for research for Bloom's kinky side, Bits of Fun was defunct by December 1920. Budgeon gets it slightly wrong in his memoir when he writes that he was just in time to get a few copies for Joyce for the heavy hand of the law descended on that periodical the following week. 40 pounds and publication stopped was the penalty. What actually happened can be seen here. Charles Arthur Lewis was fined 30 pounds in order to pay seven guineas costs for publishing a nauseating and scurrilous rag which existed merely to pander to the perverted tastes of a certain class of society. Farrar notes that Joyce likely read this notice because it is uh, his October 24th letter to Budgeon that he writes, I perceive the editor of BOF, a Jew by his name, has been up before the beak and fined, so whatever else that you send in that way had better be enclosed in a copy of the Christian Hero or some such paper. Though the last, this was by no means the first time bits of fun was threatened by the social purity movement and censorship laws. 
Originally an offshoot of the popular literary paper Tidbits, illustrated Tidbits became Photobits in 1898. The paper ran simultaneously with competitor Photo Fun from 1906 until it was bought out and merged in 1914. You can see the overlapping timeline on the right of my slide here. The paper was continuously renamed between 1898 and 1920, possibly to avoid the censor. It ran under titles such as Photo Bits, Photo Fun, New Photo Fun, New Fun, Fun, and Bits of Fun, with illustrated tidbits, Photo Bits, and Bits of Fun having the longest print runs. After Photo Bits, the paper rarely contained many photographs and instead focused on short stories that were kind of naughty, pinup drawings, uh, comedic cartoons, and of course the confidential correspondence column, which began in New Photo Fun in 1911. Here is where we run into a major anachronism in Ulysses, Bloom's copies of Photobits. Uh, though Joyce correctly names the publication Photobits, which was its name in 1904, the Photobits of 1904 bears little resemblance to the copies of Bits of Fun budget sent Joyce. The nymph whose centerfold portrait from Photobits hangs above the Bloom's bed comes to life in Circe to tell Bloom about the evil company in which she shares her pages. High kickers, coster picnickers, pugilists, popular generals, immoral panto boys in flesh tights, the stale smut of clubmen, stories to disturb callow youth, ads for transparencies, trued up dice and bus pads, proprietary articles and why wear a trust with testimonials from ruptured gentlemen, useful hints to the married, rubber goods, never rip brand, supplied to the aristocracy, corsets for men, I cure fit for money refunded. Um, unsolicited testimonials for Professor Waldman's wonderful Chesty Stuber, my bus developed four inches in three weeks. Most of these ads would not have appeared in 1904. Ads for condoms and corsets for men are particularly anachronistic here. Many of these references are specific to the confidential correspondence column, which of course did not exist in photo bits at all. It came into function in 1911. Uh, Jennifer Burns Levin addresses this anachronism in her article, How Joyce Acquired the Scale Smut of Clubsmen. Uh, Photobits underwent a serious change around 1909, though it did not fully emerge as the world's first journalistic vehicle for the exposition and discussion of domestic punishment, clothes fetishism, and cross dressing that's from Farrar um, until 1912. Burns Levin argues that Joyce likely first encountered Photobits in 1909 on one or both of his short trips to Dublin. And remembering this version of the paper, which was already becoming softcore pornography and a bit of a fetish magazine, requested copies from Budgeon in 1920. Burns Levin notes that a particular beauty contest in June 1909 for tight lacers to show off the smallest waist in the world. Both men and women competed, appearing in corsets and high heels in photographs for the contest. That was again, June, 1909. Uh, the kinds of ads and features surrounding the nymph, Levin um, says may have been available by 1909 when the stories began to get racier. Uh, Burns Levin also notes that images of women in dominating or domineering roles begin to appear in this era of the paper as well, including an image of an equestrienne and circus trainer in the 20 November, 1909 issue, calling to mind Bella Cohen's transformation into ringmaster Bella. According to this timeline, Joyce perhaps encountered photo bits in 1909, back issues kept in the outhouse of his lodgings, for example, um, and remembered these elaborate costumes when he envisioned Circe as a costume episode. However, Bloom's cross-dressing escapade and indeed any references to Bloom changing costume or the episode being a costume episode uh, appears after this point in the letters and in the Quinn protodraft. Ronan Crowley has noted that the first instance where Joyce where Joyce calls the episode a costume episode is in the same letter that Joyce asks Budgeon to get a hold of Lord Alfred Douglas's plain English, which was mentioned in an August issue of Bits of Fun um, that the Joyce likely received from Budgeon. Joyce's decision to have Bloom cross-dressing um, and have domestic punishment fantasies then seems to come from Bits of Fun rather than the opposite or Joyce desiring to acquire Bits of Fun to serve as a source for the cross-dressing scene. If Joyce did remember photo bits as a bit of a naughty paper circa 1909 or so, uh, it is likely he got more than he bargained for. However, there are other potential avenues for how Joyce may have first encountered or heard about photo bits. For example, Farrar posits that the issues of bits of fun may have been among the packet of letters and release 
of books on the theme of erotic conversion that Baroness Antoinette de Saint Leger entrusted Joyce with in 1919, according to Budgeon's memoir. Joyce took to calling her Circe during their visit to her private island, and Budgeon writes that all this material was no doubt useful enough to Joyce when a month or two later he began the composition of Circe. Another possibility is that Joyce discovered the publication from a friend in Paris. Prior to moving to Paris, there's no mention of Circe being a costume episode, and many of the now iconic queer themes and subtexts were not present in the early drafts. Circe changed monumentally between June 1920, when he began the episode in Trieste in early and in early 1921, sorry, when he finished it. Joyce called the Queen manuscript the eighth draft of the episode, demonstrating how many revisions it underwent. Joyce once insisted that he had to be in Paris to write the Circe episode. Um, and one reason for that is that the Parisian nightlife brought Manto to life with its prostitutes and bars and rowdy gutters. However, I do just want to very quickly note that Joyce often found himself in the company of queer people in Paris. Uh, from Juna Barnes and her cohort of left bank lesbians to Robert McAlman, one of Joyce's closest Paris confidants, and for the time, an openly queer man. Both Barnes and McAlman have published stories about Paris and Berlin's queer subcultures, including queer cafes, gay bars, and drag culture. People like Dan Mahoney, who inspir inspired the cross dressing Dr. Matthew O'Connor in Barnes's novel Nightwood, and McAlman's. McAlman's drag queen in Miss Knight may have been amongst Joyce's circle of acquaintances. This timeline is just about right for Joyce to have either known this person in Paris or certainly known about him. And I think it is also possible that Joyce learned about the confidential correspondence column from an inside source. It's hard to say for certain what came first, the source or the idea, um, but hopefully this presentation has been illuminating about how a single element of a text can be traced back to its origins from Bella Cohen's Nighttown brothel to cap and aprons letter to the editor of Bits of Fun. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks to you. That was so awesome. It's so awesome to to see how he wrote on uh, like his like his these pages. It was fascinating. I loved it. Uh, we have the first question. This genetic analysis is quite revealing of Joyce's writing process. Did this process change much throughout the writing of the novel? Oh, I think I think for sure it, it changed quite a bit as he was writing the novel. Um, he he he. Now I I focus mostly on this scene and and this particular instance of how he used his notes, but. I mean, there's so many examples of Joyce taking a source, scouring it for notes and copying it into a notebook uh, and then copying those, those into another notebook and then into a note sheet before adding it to a draft. So it often these things go through either multiple stages of him reading his own writing and copying them out or other people copying them out and dictation as well. So things get, especially by um, his later work by, by Finnegan's Wake, things get retranslated sort of um, and mediated from notes to notes to notes before entering the draft. And um, many of the people who um, helped him rewrite these notes changed things or, or, or ac accidentally or on purpose as they were being sort of mediated. Um, so yeah, I, think, I think Joyce's process is, um, was continuously changing, especially with his changing eyesight and his ability to read his own notes. Um, is that, does that answer the question, I think? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So we have another question. What is Joyce's purpose here? It is pure parody or does to broaden uh, the narrow definition of sexuality of the time? I, I like to think that Joyce was using parody to sort of reveal um, certain fallacies about how we think about sexuality and especially uh, sexology. So my talk uh, later in the week at Omni Scientific Joyce will be about how, how he incorporated sexology. Um, and I think Joyce was very careful and attuned to uh, thinking about sort of gender as through the social model um, as well, instead of like this medical model that it's all about genitals or whatever. I think he, he was um, very conscious of the fact that gender is a socialization and sort of a costume that we put on. Um, and I think Cersei as a costume episode really reveals that. Um, in the way that, that Joyce demonstrates that sexuality is this sort of developing uh, psychological um, part of ourselves rather than something located on the body, for example. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, I have a question myself. Is I, I because we know that he was he provoked these reactions, but at the same time, sometimes he was surprised because it, the, the reactions were like he had legal problems because of this thing. They were, he was in trouble. I asked myself. Well, I ask, I ask you. Uh, that, that's, did, did he wanted to provoke? He was uh, he, he did it on purpose or? It was just natural because I know that his personality was like this. This is one thing. But when he wrote the book, this wasn't his, inten his intention. But why then, if it, he really wanted to do, to do it, to do that, to, to provoke, why he was so surprised that he had all these problems? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really interesting question because I think I think it's a mix of the two. So especially in earlier episodes, I think he was pretty not shocked, but perhaps at least somewhat surprised that there was such a sort of um, censorship of his work and vitriol against what he was saying, especially in, um, I think it, it's episode th uh, four that gets censored in the uh, little review version where they take out the whole pooping scene. Um, and also, um, obviously, the the law came down on nausea. Um, and I think there was, there's a something about Joyce's writing that after that point just stops giving a fuck if you'll excuse my language um because he's just like if they're going to take it down because of these little things that I did I might as well go all out and so I think there is especially in Cersei um this impetus to provoke or to go farther than anyone else has because if they're all already going to censor him for things that he thought were not that big a deal then he might as well make a big deal, if that makes sense. Like, I think that he, especially in sort of later episodes, begins pushing it more once they're not being published serially anymore. Um, because if they're not going to publish um, Nausicaa, then they're definitely not going to publish Cersei, right? Yeah, but I like he was like writing it and publishing it at the same time. And he, he was getting these reactions. So I, asked, I, I, I wonder if, did he knew, from, uh, did he know? from the beginning that where where is it, is this going because i have the impression that the beginning is a little bit like milder like it's it's naughty but not as much and then he went like whoa where are you going like this rhythm because the rhythm changes in seriously like it's, it's it's really like different and it's uh, completely out of proportion with the other chapters you think that it happened like at the moment that he started to write because or did you think he, he was planning on doing that? Like, I, I, I can't feel that he was like complicating it, at, like going further and further, but then it went like, whoa. So do you think he planned it? Or maybe, like, as you said, it was like a reaction to the reaction. I think in some ways it must be a reaction to the reaction. Um, especially when we think about how many drafts Cersei went through. So the, the, the one that I've showed where we sort of get this first scene of the, the cross-dressing and the sex transformation, um, the John Quinn draft, this is already draft eight. So he's rewritten the entire episode eight times at this point, or certainly added tons and tons of material. And he at first thought that Cersei was only going to take him a couple of months to write, and then it ended up taking a very long time. Um, and it's mostly because it went through so many revisions and drafts and changes. Um, I think partially that might be because he was reacting to the um, the, the civil suit in the United States uh, against Nausicaa and the printing of, of the Little Review um, chapters. But also, I think that you know at that point he was he was so in tuned to making it, Cersei this repetition of the whole book. I mean, a lot of that material sort of comes later as well, where you get the the recurring characters and motifs from the earlier episodes into Cersei. Um, that when he decided it was going to be this sort of really interior monologue of Bloom's um, sort of psychosexual energy, that he had to push it further because he'd already dropped all these hints that you know Bloom was uh, quite a, a sexually fluid and kinky sort of dude. Um, that if he didn't push it farther, it wouldn't be that reflection of the earlier episodes made fantastical. Um, so I, th I think that's a, probably a combination. It's like some of it may be reactionary, like, um, oh, you don't like when I discuss this, I'm going to make it so much bigger and more in, in Cersei. Um, but also possibly just sort of a natural extension of how he was writing the episode and how he continues to add material Okay, I also wonder, uh, did he have like uh, notions of 
psychotherapy, subconscious things, because for me, this chapter is like, okay, let's just take a swim on the, on the subconscious, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it was, I, 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 is, it, was it conscious? He was doing it, this like, this is like the subconscious of Bloom. We've seen before, like this, like uh, little sexual fixations that he had, but here we, we could like enter in his really like, like really deep in his in, in his subconscious. So he was doing this. Uh, I know that he, he had this. I don't know if the Jung episode, like if he, he had this relationship with Jung before he wrote this or after. Uh, what's he doing it uh, like consciously, like going on, <laughs> consciously to the subconscious? I, I think he was, yeah. He was certainly reading a lot of um, sexology, which has tons of overlap with with um, sort of the psychoanalytic revolution. Like that sort of um, one came from the other. Um, psychoanalysis superseded sexology in a lot of ways. And a lot of these these texts, like, like Freud, um, Freud's early work, especially, um, and of course later Jung and other psychoanalysts, um, we're drawing from a lot of the, the stuff that was was coming from early sexology. So it, Joyce was certainly exposed to the sexology, um, which I talked about more in my other talk, which uh, unfortunately I did not have a lot of time to bring in here. Um, but um, I think he was at least aware of Freud um, by writing, by the time of Ulysses. Um, uh, I know in, in Finnegan's Wake, it becomes so much more of that with the... Um, the leap year girls who are young and easily Freudened. So you have the young and, and uh, Freud there um, in the multiple personalities of Issy uh, in Finnegan's Wake. But I, I think there was definitely something there uh, in Ulysses as well. And, and that he was certainly interested in um, both like medical and psychological sources for his work. So we, who, uh... What leads us to the next question it's, uh, uh, is David Schurman is asking, uh, Circe seems like a good intro to the wake, no? So c can you, like, you were already mentioning the wake, can you uh, deepen on that? Uh, Circe is an intro to the wake. Um, yeah, I think so. I think, I think you get a lot of the same vibes uh, from, from Circe because it's so, interior and fantastical and you get this this flowingness but I mean I think just reading Ulysses in general is a good introduction to the wake um we, there's so many different styles in all the episodes of Ulysses um I, that it's hard to say you know what will prepare you for the wake because I don't think anything will um <laughs> I think just jump right in with both feet would be my sort of advice but I mean Cersei is written sort of like a play so there's a lot more structure to Cersei than to the wake, but I think they do share a lot of similarities in terms of this sort of um, ability to flow from scene to scene without uh, interruption or having to like break because it is this, this um, almost like changing sets and changing costumes throughout the entire play of Cersei. Okay, like you, we know that the, the novel was published like chapter by chapter. How did readers of the time react to, to Circe? Just, Circe was never published as, a, ah. as an episode. Um, so because, um, so Nausicaa, which was episode 14, um, I believe. Yeah, 14. So it would have been the one right below, before Circe was um, taken to court and um, tried for obscenity. Um, and it was banned in the United States, Ulysses was banned before it was ever published because of because of Nausicaa, which is, of course is um, there's the scene where he masturbates on the beach, um, and people took such offense to that that it was shut down at that point. Um, so the rest, so Circe, um, Ithaca, um, and Penelope, which also has quite a bit of raunchiness to it, um, none of those were ever published serially. So there was never sort of a a public reaction to an episodic nature with Cersei because it didn't come out until the whole book came out at once, um, which I think makes it different from from the other the other episodes, which most of the book was episodic, but then Cersei was the first one that was not uh, published that way. 
Okay, so but, but then when the book came out, the, 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 were there like specific reactions to this chapter or it was too deep for people because at least in Nausicaa they, they could read it, but here you just go like further and maybe they were just so lost or there were some like reactions, like notorious reactions to Circe at the time. I can't think of any. I think so many people just sort of wrote off the whole book as obscene at that point and said, I'm not going to read any of it. It's all trash. Um, that there wasn't like a whole lot of focus on on Cersei. Yeah, I don't think people really got that far um, if they were sort of more casual readers or reading in order to find something to spite Joyce with, you know, um, these sort of spiteful uh, people. I don't think they ever got that far into the book. Um, Someone can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but um, I, I I can't think of any specific reactions to that chapter. Um, I know there were some reactions to Penelope um, and people being very upset by Penelope, um, which is of course this uh, beautiful rendering in a woman's voice of her exploring her sexuality um, and thinking about, about um, committing adultery on her husband as well. And people were quite upset by that. But I think Penelope is also one of those chapters that you can sort of skip to and read. Um, whereas Cersei, I mean, Cersei is almost like half the length of the book. Like it is the longest episode by far. And the first few pages of it aren't that um, obscene or upsetting. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure people really got to the, the parts that were like really out there unless they were actual fans of Joyce um, and the people who were, you know, passing them underground. Yeah, I can say like the first time I read it, that was the part like was harder for me. I was like, I just, and it's so long, it's 200 pages long. I was like, I was, when this is like, I, I, I'd call it this theater play is gonna end. And then the second time, because like reading the releases is like, uh, rereading all the time then it became my favorite because it's like it made me laugh so much because after you read the Ulysses for the, the for the first time it changes it changes your 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 way of reading the uh, the fact that it was so outside of the the rest of the book it it, it uh, I, wa I was lost I was I I came through it and and talking about that this is going to be the last questions because we have like three minutes uh, that was exactly like my first impression of this chapter. I, I, I call it the crazy theater play. So can you talk a little bit about like uh, the, the idea of writing it like a, the a, a theater play? Well, I, th I think Joyce, I mean, Joyce's relationship to theater is very complex. Um, he did write a play, Exiles, um, and he was a huge fan of Ibsen and he read Wilde and, and like, sort of drama as a genre, it really interested Joyce. And I think it just, I mean, he was so concentrating on making each episode a very unique style that it, when it came to making a play, I think it, 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 it sort of just makes sense from, from a development standpoint, um, especially coming um, sort of out of um, Nausicaa and Oxen. Sorry, Oxen comes between Nausicaa. Nausica. So Oxen was actually the first chapter that wasn't serialized, I've just realized. Um, but Oxen of the Sun, which is also quite difficult and plays with all these different styles, right? Um, sort of goes through the development of English language. I think going to drama from that uh, is sort of a natural extension of the project. Um, but what makes Cersei so interesting as a drama, first of all, it's, it could just be a book in itself. As you said, it's over 200 pages long. It, it, it practically is um, a microcosm of Ulysses. Um, you could sort of read that and understand the general trajectory of what happens in Ulysses, I think. Um, but to then make it like an episode of, of costumes and costumes of the mind as well, um, I think is, is just a, a really playful way of working with imaginary drama. Like there's certain things you can't do uh, in a real play. Like you could never perform Cersei because there's just costume changes every other line and so many fantastic things happen you know, people are changed into animals. Um, the only thing I can think of in, in you know, is, is that line in, in one of the Shakespeare plays where someone exits pursued by bear, um, which is again, something you can't really do in traditional drama. You can't just bring a live bear on stage uh, very easily. But in Cersei, Joyce could do whatever he wanted. It was, it was theater of the mind. And I think that's sort of where it comes from. It comes out of Oxen saying, okay, there are all these literary styles. What can I do with this literary style? 
of the play and make it so wild. And it's, he turns the play into a theater of the mind. Yeah, well, uh, luckily we have now like animation. So mm -hmm. maybe somebody can think about like, like this is like an animation would be a, a super idea. Thank you very much. I know that it's, uh, the time is off. And this was really exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to meet you. I'm gonna, when we not pass the 15th chapter, I'm gonna cut this part of the video and, and, and show it to them. So um, maybe I have to translate it. <laughs> that, that would be, uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure uh, talking to you. Thank you for having me. Now we're gonna uh, go with Mary Lawton. Who I'm meeting today because I also follow her on, on Twitter. She's kind of participating in, in my reading, in my online reading that is in Spanish, but she's, she's very kind to, to, to go with the, with the schedule that we have and publishing things and commenting things. I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that, that, that you like reading along with us. Uh, Mary Lawton, are you connected already? I don't. Yes, Geraldine. Uh, okay, much. hi, hi. Thank you so much for accepting and <laughs> nice to meet you. Meet you, but well, meet you. <laughs> lovely to meet you too. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, I'm gonna present you. Uh, Mary Lawton is a PhD researcher in the School of English uh, on the, at the University College, Cork in Ireland. She's from the place. And her presentation examines the interrelationship of James Joyce's Ulysses and Phineas Fletcher's 17th century epic poem, Purple Island or the Isle of Man, in a sense that both of them explore the human body. So welcome, Mary. We look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Geraldina. As Geraldine said, my, my presentation today is on the correspondences between microcosm and macrocosm in James Joyce's Ulysses and Phineas Fletcher's The Purple Island or the Isle of Man. When reading Joyce, a reader cannot help but pause, reflect, and almost certainly attempt to trace any illusion they come across. That's half the fun. As you're aware, it's possible to pick up Ulysses. The same goes for Finnegan's Wake. Open it at any page and immediately feel its thrall. The tendency to follow any word, phrase, term or offshoot to see where it leads is sometimes easy and sometimes not. Much like the appendix is an offshoot of the cecum in the human body, Phineas Fletcher's The Purple Island or The Isle of Man is an offshoot of Ulysses in the literary body. As Susan Bassnett suggests, all writing is interconnected. There are relationships between writers and their texts, other writers and their works, between narratives and other narratives, relationships that cross many boundaries, be they temporal, linguistic, geographical, or traversing other limits within a cultural or academic context. Writing is also a comparative endeavor. A, a writer begins a literary work, but poised at the end of the pen, are hovering over the keyboard are the spectres of every book opened, every narrative ever read or remembered. Joyce is no exception. Today I briefly examine correspondences between two texts which are centuries apart. Joyce's Ulysses and Phineas Fletcher's The Purple Island or The Isle of Man. Both Ulysses and The Isle of Man explore the human body. Framed by a pastoral setting, including singing shepherds and nymphs, Fletcher's poem is an allegory comparing the body to an island. For seven days, Thurstall the shepherd tells the tale of the Isle of Man. Devotional to an extent, it refers to the creation and the fall and allocates cantos two to seven to anatomical description, depicting the human senses and qualities, imagination, reason, and more importantly, the human soul. Alongside the verses, Fletcher writes much needed anatomical notes in the marginalia to aid the reader in understanding the poetry. 
Bodily functions are described in minute detail, emphasizing Fletcher's interest in anatomy. As a Renaissance author, he expressed a keen interest in the human body and the human being, more importantly, as part of the universe. William York Tyndall notes this importance in his book, James Joyce, His Way of Interpreting the World. He refers to Fletcher's fascination with and his medieval belief in a correspondence between microcosm and macrocosm, emphasized by his identification of the organs with features of the landscape in the poem. This belief that the human body represents the broader universe results in discourse throughout the poem, detailing the physical anatomy of the individual. Bones are the foundation, the heart, liver and stomach are cities, the eyes are watchtowers, the tongue a groom who delivers all. Veins, arteries, nerves are purple rivers. The tormentor is the colon, home to the wind which vexes the body, the bladder, home to a urine lake. Philosopher George Boas, in his article, Macrocosm and Microcosm, suggests a correspondence between these concepts is a pathetic fallacy, and at best, obsolete, except as a figure of speech. For Fletcher, however, the idea is integral to his writing, emphasizing the contemporary belief that nature and humanity reflect one another. For Joyce, this reflection converts to what it's like to be a human being. Hence, what the characters in Ulysses think, say, and how they react to one another and their surroundings. In the classical world, the elements within a human being were taught to parallel the universe's divine order. Thus, a divine being's intention or plan was visible on the countenance and figure of humankind. God's handiwork was on display in the human body and its study reinforced the as above, so below, as below, so above principle. To understand the workings of oneself was to understand the universe and the earth or geocosm we inhabit and vice versa. Fletcher concisely describes it in his first canto, the sum of all, the whole, yet of the whole, a part. Fifteen episodes in Joyce's Ulysses reflect Fletcher's work by their attention to specific organs of the human body. Joyce's blueprint of humanity, Leopold Bloom, displays an awareness of the possibilities and normalcy of the human condition. This body has gumption, it has a purpose, and we as readers meet other individuals as we walk beside Bloom, observing them through his eyes and interactions, and observing Bloom from their perspective, measuring his worth in the universe. In September 1920, Joy sent a detailed schema of Ulysses to Carlo Leonati. Accompanying it, Joyce wrote, each adventure, every hour, every organ, every art being interconnected and interrelated in the structural scheme as a whole. Each adventure is, Joyce said, so to say one person, although it is composed of persons. Thus, while we automatically think and focus on Bloom, Molly and Stephen, multiple personalities are at play in the novel. As Tyndall asserts, the relations of man and woman, parents and children, man and society, man and art, man and the universe are central concerns. These concerns fill the pages of Ulysses. Joyce augments his Isle of Man with an infusion of humanness, an injection of personality, increasing the poem's topography in his novel. His bloom walks, talks and breathes, uprooting himself from the landscape, floating along the Dublin streets. Before delving into specific parallels between boat works, I will just give some background information on Phineas Fletcher. He was the son of a Kentish clergyman educated at Eton, Cambridge. A metaphysical poet and anatomist, 
his epic poem, The Purple Island, written in 12 cantos, was published in 1633. Metaphysical poets, of whom Don was the first, lived in an age of scientific discovery. Finding their inspiration in religion and scientific pursuits, rather than the world of human emotions, sights and sounds. As a result, themes are invariably serious and they used conceits, comparisons which are strange rather than apt. An island as a human body is a fitting example of one such conceit. Now in Ulysses, we find an urban framework, a cityscape, and nary a single singing shepherd to be found, although there are quite a few nymphs. Joyce, speaking to his friend Frank Budgen in 1918 about Fletcher's work, states the following. Among other things, my book is the epic of the human body. The only man I know who has attempted the same thing is Phineas Fletcher. But then his purple island is purely descriptive a kind of coloured anatomical chart of the human body. In my book, the body lives and moves through space and is the home of an entire personality. The words I write are adapted first to express its functions than another. In Lestragonians, the stomach dominates and the rhythm of the episode is that of the peristaltic movement. To consider Fletcher's work as purely descriptive and a kind of coloured anatomical chart dilutes its complexity. On the contrary, given the period of its construction, it is a remarkably astute portrait of the human body, couched in pastoral imagery and scientific knowledge. In 1967, the New York Journal of Medicine described the poem as an incongruous fusion of poetry and science. More recently, J. H. Sade wrote in Bodies by Art Fashioned that the poem is not only one of the best, but also one of the last great examples of the tradition of poetic correspondence in English literature. John Ridding Young, in a Versailles Journal article, notes how Fletcher finds the most obscure correspondences and signatures in his work. He racks his imagination and that of his reader to find analogies in the geocosm for almost every part of the microcosm. While the epic poem is colorful, combining natural imagery and anatomical terminology, this does not detract from how it traces similarities between the human body, the universe and the earth. Like the anatomical pathways it depicts, arguably it is much more than mere skin and bones. In Ulysses, Joyce takes Fletcher's template, modifying it by introducing tactile imagery, fusing sights, sounds, tastes, and smells with emotions and memories, adding what the metaphysical Fletcher foregoes in favor of scientific knowledge, theological discourse, and pastoral organic eloquence. Moreover, Joyce's positioning of the individual at the forefront of Ulysses escalates the intellect, emotions, perceptions, and thought processes. As Frank Budgeon observes in James Joyce and the Making of Ulysses, Joyce in Zurich was a curious collector of fact about the human body, especially on that borderland where mind and body meet, where thought is generated by the state of the body. Although the intellect or prince of the island <coughs> in Fletcher's poem, is discussed and noted as the governing force. In Ulysses, the mind, whilst remaining the governing party, is examined through an array of literary styles. These include a third and first person perspective, interior monologues, hallucinations, and answer and question format. This allows its readership to survey the figures of Bloom and Stephen, complete with their flaws, quirks and bodily functions, while also exploring their thoughts, experiences and memories. It is clear that Fletcher's classical anatomy and Homer's narrative framework blend in 
Joyce's work to create an odyssey of a flesh and blood character, Bloom, who becomes, as Joyce described to his friend Budgeon, for his creator, a complete man, a good man. Emotions, thoughts, relationships and bodily functions combine, crafting a whole microcosmic unit containing diverse elements that parallel and interact with the microcosmic world around Bloom. Given that the theme of this academic panel is origins, I thought it apropos to include a section of this discussion to Joyce's complete man, the Greek Odysseus, the Latinized Ulysses. When Budge, Budgeon asks Joyce about his complete man, Joyce responds, Ulysses is son to Laertes, but he is father to Telemachus, husband to Penelope, lover of Calypso, companion in arms of the Greek warriors around Troy, and king of Ithaca. Don't forget that he was a war dodger who tried to evade military service by simulating madness. He might never have taken up arms and gone to war, but the Greek recruiting sergeant was too clever for him. And while he was ploughing the sands, placed young Telemachus in front of his plough. Taking my bearings from Joyce's words for his complete man, I navigated a course through Ulysses, pausing at some key reference points connecting the two texts. I searched for the son, the father, the husband, the lover, and the companion in arms, expounded by Joyce. I begin with a companion in arms of the Greek warriors. When Joyce talks about the Greek hero's reluctance to take up arms, he refers, of course, to the oath of Tyndarius, an oath taken by Helen's suitors, including Ulysses. In exchange for Penelope's hand, Ulysses takes the pledge vowing to protect Helen and her chosen husband Menelaus from future attacks. When Helen is kidnapped, Ulysses does not wish to fight in the ensuing Trojan War. His reason, an oracle's prophecy foretelling it will be decades before he would return home to Ithaca and his family. Nevertheless, Agamemnon, Menelaus's brother, sends the clever Palamedes to persuade Ulysses to join forces with him. Palamedes is the Greek recruiting sergeant Joyce mentions to Budgeon. In Ithaca, Ulysses feigns madness by ploughing salt in his fields. Realising the subterfuge, Palamedes puts the infant Telemachus in the plough's path. Unable to kill his young son, Ulysses' trickery is revealed. He goes to war. Fletcher mentions Ulysses more than once in his work, along with Troy and a myriad of other Greek heroes and locations in the first canto. Fletcher devotes the better part of two stanzas to the Greek warrior in the eighth canto, writing that Ulysses was loath to change his love and quiet reign, for glorious war deeds did crafty madness feign. Fletcher then continues with, finally the workman framed the toilsome plough, drawn with an ox and ass on equal pair. While he with busy hand his salt did sow, and at the furrow's end his dearest heir did helpless lie, and Greek lords watching still observed his hand, guided with careful will. Joyce echoes Fletcher's retelling of a single moment in his quest for a complete man at one with the universe. His bloom, a whole man, comprises many parts, including the roles of father and son. Fathers and sons resonate throughout Ulysses. As we're aware, Bloom is father to a dead son and son to a dead father. As a roaming son, Stephen sums up fatherhood in the Scylla and Charybdis episode when he says, fatherhood in the sense of conscious begetting is unknown to man. It is a mystical state founded like the world, macro and microcosm upon the void. Here, as Fletcher does, Joyce blends scientific discovery with theological inference, emphasizing the void between God and his creation and pairing this with the father-son relationship in Ulysses. In Calypso, we meet Bloom, a husband and lover, 
I thought it only fair to mention one of the nymphs alluded to earlier. Bloom thinks about kidneys and the faint scent of urine they emit. In stanza 24 of the second canto of Fletcher's poem, there is an analysis of the passages transporting the urine from the kidneys to the bladder. A note in the margin reads, some affirm that in the passage stands a curious lid or cover. It's an interesting thread considering Joyce's choice of organ for the nymph episode and Calypso's etymological significance. One meaning of the name Calypso is to cover. In the Sirens episode, we find many references to body parts, including gouty fingers, little fingers, heads, lips, breasts, necks, skin, hands, nose wings, eyes, corpuscle islands, and of course ears, the organ associated with this musical episode. Again, corpuscle island is an interesting gem, since corpuscle also means little body. Indeed, Joyce mentions the word body 74 times in Ulysses. Like other sections of Ulysses, vital sea imagery vies for space with anatomical references, almost like the coastal Isle of Man. When we return home once more in Ithaca, the foundation of the body in both Joyce's work and Fletcher's poem, we see a journey of the waters for Bloom and Stephen. Fletcher's purple rivers transform into an incredibly detailed account of water itself. Also, the vastness of the universe and our place in it are palpable in the episode's garden segment. Finally, Fletcher's urine lake is expressed by both Bloom and Stephen. Despite the affinity Bloom shares with the Homeric nomad, he also represents the daily concerns of every man. As a single entity, a microcosmic unit, he walks the streets of Dublin, expressing and elucidating the community's trepidations as a whole. His body, though a part, represents the whole. One man is every man. No man is every man. Every man is part of the universe or the microcosm. And that completes my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and I welcome any comments you may have. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Mary. That was, that was really interesting that. Thank uh, you. Uh, we, we have already some questions. The first question would be, uh, why are there no bodily correspondences in the first three chapters of releases? Was this an idea that only developed as his writing progressed? Um, for me, I think the reason is because the first three chapters focus on um, Stephen and the idea of Telemachus. And in the um, Homer's Odyssey, Telemachus starts at 20, 21 years of age. So I think once we meet Bloom, who is on his own odyssey, obviously in Ulysses, that Joyce perhaps then and only then thought it best to add the organs there rather than have the others in Stephen's, shall we say, part of Ulysses. No, because the... the, the um the body correspondences he used it for you for the person the the, the the correspondence with Ulysses right okay with Ulysses yes rather than Telemachus so I think because of the fact that in the original Homer's one but where Telemachus is in his twenties mm -hmm. um, when Joyce was writing he just separated the first three chapters and then went straight into Ulysses referencing the art the organs and the man etc. Okay, thank you. Second no question. Joyce departs from the 19th century novel in his inclusion of bodily functions. Why was this so important to Joyce? Was it this sense of faithfulness to the whole man? I think, like, for me, reading it, bodily functions in the novel, in Ulysses, um, there is a humanness to Ulysses and to Bloom by his interaction, by even 
any types of bodily functions like sweat or urination. There's a kind of down to earth, taking it away from the kind of Greek idea of the hero and the way that um, Ulysses behaved and act. I think with bringing it down to everyday standards, to the normal actions that we as individuals on earth actually do. And it kind of creates for us an awareness and a connection that would be there with the normalcy in the in Ulysses. Does that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from one of the uh, our participants. It's Giacomo Ward. He uh, he wrote, "Hi, Mary." And uh, inspired topic, lyrically written and musically read. Your observation that 15 episodes of Ulysses are associated with organs brings Dubliners to mind. The Joyce uses the tongue extended to receive the host in The Sisters, a green eye in An Encounter, a stammering voice in Arabic, stumbling feet in Evelyn. Was Joyce indicting the human body there too? Good to, good to know <laughs> you're not just an avatar. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, to be honest, when there's a fascination because as well with Joyce's medical background in the sense that he wanted to study medicine, he wanted to know the bodily functions, that I think it is going to come across in all his work, even in Dubliners, as you say, with the tongue and all the rest of it. It's going to come across throughout his work because there is an interest there. There is an interest in what makes the human person tick, what makes the human body versus the human soul. I think in Ulysses, he expounds on it because he wants to look for both, look for the depth in both. Initially, say with Dubliners or the others, he's just choosing separate little points there and focusing on them from the bodily aspect. Where we get when we get to Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, then it looks at the human soul and how it all works together. Um, I do think it was always an interest there. It's, it's kind of obvious when you see so many um, reference to bodily parts, a dreadful expression I must say that I'm using bodily parts in Ulysses and in the rest of his work, but there always was an interest in this anatomical scientific um, sense of the humanness. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question. You said uh, Joyce took, I, I'm fascinated always with when he takes uh, another literary work and, and stripped it and used it as a structure, you said. Uh, he used it like as a template. Then he made a complete man from the island, right? Uh, but I, I, because I am a little bit obsessed with Finnegan's Wake, I know that is yes. like outside the topic, but it, 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 what's the influence of Fletcher's poem when in the Finnegan's Wake, I like, it, it, I just thought, well, while you were talking, the man becomes an island. Uh, it's like the, 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 the contrary process, it was, it was like uh, maybe all, always like another use of uh, Fletcher's poem in Finnegan's Wake. Could have been. I mean, like Finnegan's Wake is kind of a culmination of everything to Joyce. So you're going to find all of his works in there. I definitely do think that the imagery, the coastal imagery, the rivers, the sea imagery in Finnegan's Wake um, certainly stems from the use, perhaps, and even of reading Fletcher's work, because it's there with the with the idea of um, HT as this isle, this figure, this island, this landscape itself, and the waters coming towards us. So it's it's definitely going to be there. I think you're right, Geraldina, that it is palpable in that as well. Because it's like, as I said initially at the start, I think once you read something, it's always going to be there. And so once like Joyce read Fletcher's poem, um, and it would have been there, you never really forget anything that you read, it's always there at the back of your mind, irrespective of what you're writing now yourself. So I would think that that reference there would carry over as well to Finnegan's Wake. Oh, that's fascinating. Uh, you said, uh, when, uh, you mentioned that the, the Fletcher's poem was uh, called like incongruent 
or something. And I asked, I, I wonder if Joyce felt like connected, like his choice of, uh, of writers, like to inspire from, maybe it was also because he felt like he felt connected with him, uh, with all those writers that were not understood at, at, at their time, but we, we're not talking about Shakespeare, of course, because, <laughs> but like there is a lot of, uh, well, for example, in this case, do you think he chose him also because of that or, or only because of, of the structure thing? Like it might no. be in... Mm -hmm. I think he chose him because of what um, Fletcher does with language as well. Um, because of what he kind of, how he incorporates the scientific language, but then uses such flowery prose in the actual poem. So how he kind of modifies the language and Joyce, uh, modifies language himself. So I think that would have been of interest that how Fletcher takes this animatic kind of science, science-y for want of a better word. And instead of kind of having it so dull and boring and sedate that he imbues it with this pastoral imagery and singing shepherds and nymphs and Greek gods and goddesses. So how he actually subverts the language of science. I think that would have been perhaps what Joyce liked about Fletcher. Ah, he chose and, it as be, well, because... Uh -huh. No, as well, like Joyce does mention Fletcher's cousin in Oxford of the Sun, but then in Oxford of the Sun, he mentions quite a lot of authors as well. I, I think it's more the language versus um, his obscurity. It would be how he kind of stressed the body the way he did. That would have been an appeal to Joyce, I'd say. That's just my personal opinion. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Kevin, which is uh, uh, our president. This is a comment rather than a question. Joyce's focus on the body continues in Finnegan's Wake. The body of the hero, Fine McCool, is stretched out under the city of Dublin. Hout head is fin in, Finn's head. His trunk is a space between house and the park, and his toes are the mounds sticking up out in the Phoenix Park. Thank you for a fascinating presentation. Thank you very much. Um, more, uh, comment on a question. But can comment on the on the comment. <laughs> yeah, as as you said, Geraldine. Now, when you were talking about Finnegan's Wake, the idea of the the imagery in HC and the the hero versus the body, I think as kind of as we kind of discussed, it does filter through right to the end and the culmination of his work because um, that imagery is there. The idea of island as man, purple island, island as man. So you can see Fletcher progressing through right to Finnegan's Wake with that imagery. So it's always what you read, you remember, and I think Joyce was no exception, always at the back of his mind was the idea of Fletcher's that man is nothing but an island, but still needs the community around. This kind of idea that Don went for as well, you know, that no man is an island. He's always a little part of the bigger, bigger, bigger picture. So I think that that's apparent the whole way through Joyce's work. No, oh, thank you very much. No I think we don't have any more questions. And we're heading to the end of this first session of our of academic panel. Uh, Bloomsday Montreal in his 15th anniversary. Uh, so we're going, we're finishing with, uh, with the presentations of this first session and we come back in an hour and 15 minutes at 1 p.m. East to the second part of our of academic panel. It was really exciting. I absolutely loved everything and I was so nice to put a face on, on the users <laughs> that, that we follow each other on, on Twitter for a long time. Um, thank you very much, Mary. Thank you very um, much, Geraldine. I'm so pleased to have been a part of this. I wish you all the best. Me too. Thank you. So that, with that, with that note, with uh, a man is an island, and an island is a man. We finish our first part. Uh, I don't know if uh, Miles wanted to to comment something or closing our academic first session.
Yes, uh, thank you so much uh, for that. And thanks so much for, uh, for hosting, uh, Geraldina. We will uh, continue this afternoon with uh, two presentations, uh, one by uh, Cleo Hannaway Oakley, uh, uh, talking about the uh, blind stripling and uh, references to uh, blindness in, um, in uh, Ulysses. And also, uh, uh, Marcelo Zavaloy, I know you won't want to miss either presentation, Marcelo Zavaloy, uh, who will be talking about um, uh, different uh, uh, Spanish translations, um, uh, uh, lipogrammatic uh, translations. And if you don't know what a lipogram is, it's a translation of, uh, of, 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 of a work that, uh, that excludes certain letters of the alphabet, the letter A, the letter E. So, and Marcelo is very entertaining. I'm sure Claire, uh, Cleo will be as well. So please join us at, uh, at one o'clock as we continue with the, as Geraldina hosts this uh, wonderful academic panel. And thank you again for all of your uh, participation here today and for all of the presenters who, uh, uh, you know, just, Fascinating! I can't believe how much uh, you, you know it, depth there is to every, every time. You, it, it's like peeling an onion. There's always another layer, another layer, another layer. So, thank you very much, and we hope to see you at uh, one o'clock. Thanks again, Geraldina. Thank you.